Welcome to episode two of the 360 podcast, an all-around look at student-centered education. I'm Laura Gelling. And I'm Adrian Pumphrey. And today we continue our conversation with co-author of NeuroTeach, Glenn Whitman. Hope you enjoyed the episode. So once you had a critical mass of teachers on board at St. Andrews with, with multiple modality teaching, um, what kind of changes were you guys able to track? What kind of changes did you see? Yeah, so I mean, well, well the, the, the first step is, right, how does a school uh, do what we did, right? And this is, this is some of the work we do internationally, right? It's how do you take a faculty that we know has this gap, you know, part of our conversation 15 minutes ago, right, um, that most teachers and school leaders don't have foundational knowledge and training in the learning brain, so we have this gap, uh, and then how do you get like any other school initiative? Every school has initiatives, right? Mm-hmm. How do you how do you onboard teachers into this space? Right. And not only that, keep them on board, right? Because you know you're going to have at any school, and this is where I love Julie Wilson's work. Um, uh, I think it's called from the Institute of the Future of Teaching or Education. You know you're going to have your early adopters. I mean, Park Tudor probably has it, right? You have people who read the book. NeuroTeach, right? <laughs> Frank, right? Said, you know, you know, may, you know, this, this is the new. I would like him to think it was Holt, the Holy Grail. Probably wasn't at that level, uh, <laughs> but you, but you'll have your early adopters, your innovators. But that's going to be a small percentage. Uh-huh. How do you sort of cross the chasm, as the famous book talks about, to get that sort of that majority, that that middle group? Um, the way we did it was sort of unique to school initiatives. Though I know a lot of schools are following our path. Is you know, I give our, our head of school said, "Look, we're we're this is an all-in model. Um, expert teachers know how the brain learns, works, and thrives. We are all going to get training in educational neuroscience." Mm-hmm. So the way we onboarded our faculty was over the first three years of this this initiative. We were our goal was to train 100% of our faculty. We started with the middle school teachers. They're they're much more flexible uh, about this stuff. We did the upper school teachers next because we also started to create some energy and conversations that we, we encircled them for it. Um, and then the, the key, a couple of key things. One is we started this journey in 2007 and most school initiatives will last a year or two. And then you sort of check, okay, we've done the educational neuroscience box. Let's go on to the next thing. Well, we decided, look, we, we know the educational truth that every day, every kid throughout the history of the school will have his or her brain. So mind, brain, education, science is going to be part of our professional development forever. Um, you know, even like you know, even tomorrow we're st- we're doing work with our faculty. Uh, so every year we build our PD around mind, brain, education, science. We also were not um, overly ambitious or overly threatening in this work. We we said, look, and, and it's sort of what we did in the book, right? I mean, we ended the book with the ten percent challenge, right? What 10% of your teaching can you change every year that's informed by research in, in mind, brain, education, science? 10% is, 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 should not be threatening to any teacher, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's a couple of different assessments, maybe a couple, couple of different instructional strategies. Uh-huh. Uh, we didn't do 15 because it, it didn't look pretty. Like 15 is not round enough. And 20% we thought would, would, be, would scare people, right? 20% <laughs> people. Right, and we said to our faculty, look, you know, Go slowly. You know, try one thing. You know, start your class a little better. Stop taking attendance. And uh, you know, the brain is primed. It's coming to your class. These kids are looking for novel novelty. You know, they've just maybe come from a boring class. You know, engage them. If the, if it's the class after lunch, what do you got for them? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how are you ending class better? I mean, we we do know, and we have the privilege of uh, of observing a lot of classes around the country. You know, most teachers t- end class very poorly. Um, and, and if you watch, a, you know, it be interesting to study at Park Tudor or elsewhere. Um, most teachers teach to a second. They're actually introducing new ideas or new instructions as the kids are packing up. Half their brain's already out of the class. Uh-huh. Um, and that is missing a prime time for retrieval practice, a little metacognitive moment, trying to make sure you understand what the homework actually wants you to do. Mm-hmm. Um so, I mean, you know, I ask those listeners to this podcast or, or the video, just even look at how you begin class and end class. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great way to start. And it's not, I'm not telling you what, how to teach. I'm not telling you how to teach math. I'm not telling you to teach what content to teach in history. 
uh, I'm, I'm telling you how to rethink a little bit about the design of your pedagogical practice. So, you know, by going slowly, um, then building up some speed by asking some of our early adopters to start writing about it and speaking about it. Mm -hmm. We had some models. Um, and again, not never letting our foot off the gas, so to speak, on this initiative. You, you, you at St. Andrews, no teacher could have could run and hide and think this initiative was going away. It is. It is everywhere. It's part of our DNA. Um, we have student research fellows now. We have faculty research fellows now. So, um, I, I challenge any school that's been on a longer initiative than ours, which is now and it's starting its twelfth year in mind brain education science, and it's not an initiative anymore. It's 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 part of our DNA. It's part of our fabric. It's part of a. Uh, um, if you want to be an expert teacher and an excellent teacher at St. Andrews, you will go. You will get on this uh, mind brain education science journey. And thankfully, we have uh, an awesome group of faculty who want to learn and, and be part of it. That's awesome. How have you yeah. seen a change in the students since you've adapted the the research informed approach? Yeah, I mean, I I think the best example, you know. So, you know, from the faculty side, I, I, we brought more choice and more novelty. We're doing feedback uh, and assessment better. I think there's more knowledge transfer through the arts. You know, we, we talk, a lot of schools talk about arts integration. We actually talk about it as a way to not transfer knowledge in new ways. And it actually has allowed us probably to covertly get more arts integration. Um, our faculty, I think, uh, think more about... Um, talking about the process, the effort versus the, the achievement. The achievement still matters. Um, from the student perspective, I think they've, um, on some ways they, they've pushed back and said, why aren't you just teaching us the research directly uh, as opposed to going through the teachers? Uh, part of that is we know that the, the great differentiator for student success and well-being and the, achievement and school experience is putting high quality teachers in front of the students. Um, we also know that if you don't have the faculty buy-in and, this, and the, at the class is not looking any different, um, um, then you know it doesn't matter what the students know. Um, to answer your question, I think the students are feeling much more uh, empowered and self-aware in that we want is we, we want them to confidently feel that they all their brains are different. They have strengths and weaknesses. Um, there are strategies and th around things like memory um, that we are giving them directly. Uh, we are coaching them how to do flashcards better is a great example. So flashcards are still an awesome way um, to, to practice, to learn knowledge. Uh -huh. um, but observe your park tutor students. We observe them all. You know, most of them will turn the flashcard too quickly. So they're, they're not creating that struggle um, and they actually think they know it when they when they actually don't, right? Um, so not surprisingly, hey, I studied flashcards all night, and they show up at the assessment the next day, and they're like, well, where's that knowledge, right? And um, they they've sort of been lulled into thinking that they they've embedded this into their long term memory and consolidated it. So giving kids a, a, um, a robustly researched strategies, um, certainly we do that much more now. We, we love the work of the learning scientists. I don't know if they're on your radar. They have wonderful podcasts and classroom posters that every teacher should be using. Um, we're huge fans of them. Uh, uh, we have an online strategies binder, virtual strategies binder we're creating for students. So if they think, hey, I'm struggling with my attention in my this class, what might be some you know new 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 solutions other than the teacher say pay attention? Yeah, I mean that's a default. So I, I think it's fertile ground. I uh, for this, I think what we are trying to do very intentionally is, you know, this is a um, in the book we use the phrase and we love the phrase that teach, teaching and learning is a shared authority, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, between the teacher and the student, um, and we love that sort of mindset, right? Um, and that ongoing conversation of what's working for me, what's not working for me and giving teachers that broader sense of research informed strategies to help all kids meet um, what I hope is their peak potential um, um, is, is what we, 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 we're in this work for. We, we love our teaching. We love our content. Don't you want your stuff to stick longer than the summit of assessment? Mm -hmm. right. So 
Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, I, I want when it's a 30th reunion. I want a kid to be able to tell me who uh, about Lyndon Baines Johnson. If I ask who LBJ is and they say LeBron James, I'm a little concerned. <laughs> so, but that's a, that's my another one of my snarky jokes. <laughs> um, so we're, we're probably going to have uh, some parents listening to this as well. And, oh, good, um, awesome. I wanted to come back to you know what you said about especially going from eighth to ninth grade. All of a sudden, college becomes a, a much more of a consideration. Uh, you know, and that's still important to think about um, holding that balance for a parent who is worried about getting their kid into a great college, um, but, but you know, also just thinking about preparing them for that experience, um, and at the same time bringing in all the stuff from this book and just thinking about encouraging them to play and be curious and all this sort of thing. Um, how would you encourage parents to hold that balance? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I think uh, eventually we're, we're, you know, we got NeuroTeach. Uh, we got, well, well, I guess we got to make this a franchise and write NeuroParent at some point, <laughs> um, right? You know, I think it starts with, you know, look, and, and you know, I, I, I hope schools like Park Tudor and others around the world who are reading NeuroTeach that things are going to look, feel, and be different mm -hmm. in the hallways, in the classrooms, in the instruction. The problem with this from uh, for those parents listening is that uh, that's not how most parents were educated, right? So, you know, parents out there who listen or watch, I love you guys. Okay, I just want to say that. <laughs> but I, I do want to say, you know, you bring the curse of experience. And if you if you look, if you walk into the schools and, and feel like, hey, this could have been my school, or if you go back to back to school night and, hey, that you know, that sounds exactly like my history teacher in 10th grade, then that's a prop. That's actually a problem, <laughs> right? But the pro the, the problem from the is that parents are thinking if if their kids come home, let's say a teacher decides to give less homework, right? Because uh, you know, and in general, most parents want that. Like, but parents still evaluate the quality of the teacher in the school too much by the amount of homework they give. So you you can't have it both ways. I mean, we know more about the learning brain than we certainly did 10 years ago and, and certainly 20 years ago, right? So schools should be different. Your child's uh, assessment type should be broader. Uh -huh. Their study strategy should be broader. And if, if you look at it and say, well, you know, we taught, we learned algebra one this way, or, you know, there was a lot more rote memorization when I was a student. Why aren't you doing it? You know, give us a break in many ways. If, if Park Tudor is committing to being a research informed school and using NeuroTeach or other books, you know, let them experiment, let them try. I mean, you know, the kid, your kids are going to be fine. We're not asking you, we're not asking any school that reads the book. We remind them, you know, do not lower your bar, right? Keep your achievement bar as aspirational and as high as you want that. What, what parents should be glad to start hearing um, is that we are trying we, we know what barriers to learning we should start lowering. And, and um, again, keep your bar high, but can we lower the barriers? And we probably get, we got that concept early on from Judy Willis, Dr. Judy Willis, who we reference in the book quite a bit, who, who's got the best website out there. I think it's a rad You know, she's from California, not surprising. <laughs> um, but you know, um, I think that's really important. I think parents also, you know, it's, we know, uh, if there's any research I would share with parents out there that we need your help on is, is the research around, uh, multitasking, mm -hmm. right? You, you got, we know, we know the power, the dopamine boost that technology gives our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you are not policing at home, the distance between where the cell phone or the the, uh, the digital device sits when a student is trying to do his or her assignments, mm -hmm. then I'm not trying to make enemies. You're not doing your job. I mean, that's all I can say. We we anytime your son or daughter transitions or switches task switches from you know focusing on let's say writing an English essay or doing a a hard math problem or even independent reading and uh, um, to to checking a phone. One is they don't go. Your brain does not multitask, mm -hmm. right? You cannot do two cognitive functions at the same time, right? You can breathe and certainly read at the same time. That that's yes, okay. Uh -huh. 
the, the belief that your son or daughter are, goes back to where they were on writing that essay or math problem or independent reading, it, it, we know is not true, right? So they're actually making their homework longer, and it's very inefficient. Uh -huh. So if there's one piece of research I would love parents to help us with is, is this myth of multitasking. Mm -hmm. um, even though we all do it, I get it. Um, I, I, you could help Park Tudor. You could help all of us and all those teachers you know, use social media as a reward and get the cell phone out of the bedroom at night. There's just no question. Even the cell phone that's off in the room creates, from what we understand, this anticipation mm -hmm. that that hurts sleep. Yeah. And we know the power of sleep. Uh -huh. um, so, um, and parents, it, it is a sleep is a pedagogical method, is an instructional strategy. It, and I think teachers and parents need to embrace that. It's why I ask myself anytime I write a homework assignment, I do ask myself, and I give homework, I think homework's important. Uh, is this worth my st a student staying up any later than she or he has to? Uh -huh. um, and that's one of my one of my thresholds for do I do I have a good enough assignment? Yeah. Hope, oh, I hope that gives so parents out there uh, email me and let me know if that was helpful at all. <laughs> um, you mentioned you you were talking about homework. Um, and I know that you said that different schools are going to look different and sort of apply different aspects um, of the research differently. Um, did St. Andrews make any school-wide changes in their homework, or was it left to individual teachers or departments? Yeah, so, I mean, look, homework's the elephant in the room for all of us, right? Uh, you know, the research is still fair, is held up pretty well, roughly 10 minutes a night per grade level. So if you think about that, right, you know, a total of two hours would be, you know, um, probably good. You know, when we surveyed our, uh, we, we're, we've been doing a big homework study of our, with our student research fellows at the center. And, you know, we, we, we gave students the opportunity in a survey to say, uh, if you could choose the right amount of homework for you, what would it be? We gave the opportunity to say zero. Uh, most of them came back and said 90 minutes is a sweet spot, which actually, you know, that's pretty close to the research, Yeah. which is really good. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things. I give our head of school a lot of credit for telling our faculty, look, I will not, me I, I will never measure you as a quality teacher based upon how much, how much homework you get. Matter of fact, I probably would do the opposite. If, if you feel, if you're giving homework that I don't think is a good assignment, I, you know, I wish you would stop. I think that's a nice message from the school leader that a lot of teachers need to hear. Um, I think around homework, what we've done, uh, um, in many ways, you know, I, I probably, probably my first 10 years of teaching, I could speak from the, the I perspective here, I probably didn't miss a night of homework. I really thought that that, that, that was essential. Um, but as I gave up the reins of, of the classroom a little more to the kids, I, found, I started to find that we were accomplishing some things in class because I didn't feel like I had to be the sage on the stage and my voice being done all the time that otherwise would, would be left to homework. Um, I think the biggest change in our school around homework is that, you know, we, we, uh, we're launching the, the 2018, 19 school year with a brand new daily schedule. Um, and I get part of that was an outcome of our homework research study at our school. Um, no student, I think, uh, four of the five days students only have, uh, four classes on one day. They have five classes which means they will never have homework for every subject or discipline ever, um, which we know creates a lot of fatigue, a lot of emotional stress for the parents and the students, and, and becomes compliance, about compliance, not about learning. Yeah. Um, and we also know it probably leads to cheating um, as well. Uh, um, so, you know, that has probably been, uh, you know, uh, a real big, we, we said, look, how do we take care of the, of the health and well-being and not lose the academic rigor as a school. Um, and we know homework is one of the great stressors. If, if you only have half your classes to prepare for the next day, that's a huge win. I don't know how Park Tudor's schedule is set up, but last year, three of your five days, you had all your classes. So immediately kids are saying, ah, thank you, right? I mean, that's a, that's a really, really good, good sign. We also try to, you know, get coaching, you know, homework, you know, um, you know, I, I think homework that's about retrieval practice because there's this really nice space between the class you had that day mm -hmm. 
and when you look back on that class at night. Um, so as we think about things like the spacing effect and Mark McDaniel and and and, and Rodiker's work and make it books like Make It Stick, um, you know you have, you've created this wonderful gap uh, of time lapse that even if homework was just retrieval practice, like a five minute like what was the the, the 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 three most important things from class that day, you know, start first by without your notes and then go to your notes. To me, that's great homework. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, that is ways to think about. Um, I think, you know, connecting class to something that's personally relevant is really great homework. It, it creates intrinsic motivation and engagement that we all know at eight or nine or 10 o'clock at night when kids might be starting their homework might be the gateway to, to good attention to the homework. Um, the other thing we're exploring, and I'm, real, I'm actually really excited with this because I think this is low hanging fruit for teachers. There, there is some evidence in research that's, that's emerging that merely telling students uh, the purpose of an assignment is creates a uh, buy-in and intrinsically motivate students in ways that if you just say read pages 37 and third through 47 in, in your textbook doesn't. So one thing we're experimenting a little with at St. Andrews this year is when you post homework in our learning management system, uh, your homework is preceded by a statement of the purpose of the assignment is blank or I, I hope you get out of this assignment blank. We're really intrigued by that. And again, we're not telling you what assignments to give. No. We are just telling you how to quote unquote sell it better. And I, I would argue that would be a fun place for schools to play and a, and a piece of low hanging fruit that I would love feedback for. So for all the teachers out there who are listening, try it and, and let us let us know. And the other challenge I'll give teachers and I, uh, I, I might be rambling a little, but uh, your know, homework gets me excited here. Uh, <laughs> You know, last year for the first time, I didn't give homework for two weeks. I just went cold turkey. Uh -huh. I said, I'm going to try it. And uh, it was the one of the ironies was I got two calls from parents thinking I wasn't being hard enough on the kids. <laughs> but boy, it is, you know, the teaching brain is a learning brain. Um, and what if I'll tell you, it was one of the most enjoyable learning experiences I've had in 25 years in education. Well, we only have a few minutes left, but I just wanted to finish by um, asking you about what's next. I, I know as, a, as an informed, uh, research-informed school and a research-informed person, uh, uh, you're constantly asking, you know, what's next? What's, you know, what's next to learn and, and, uh, and learn from? Um, so where, where do you go after this? So the, the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning that I, that I lead, we're, we're in a very privileged position. And we're in a privileged position in that we are, are currently um, and we remain the only mind-brain education science research center with an international public purpose in the U U.S. And, and we, we've loved working with other schools around the country to, to sort of replicate the model. Um, with that privilege comes, uh, uh, I would argue, a lot of responsibility. Um, to, to, to share our work um, through, obviously, books like NeuroTeach or our publication, Think Differently and Deeply. We really enjoyed every in-person workshop and on-site workshop we've done at schools or conferences. Um, but to be honest, we're not, I, I think when, when the center was, was uh, created and we really said, okay, look, we want to serve public and charter schools around the world e equally well as what I think what I knew would be private schools would gravitate to this work a little more easily just because we're a little more nimble, we're a little more agile, and we, we're a little more flexible. So the one thing we wanted to still do is, is how do we get our in-person and our published work um, in ways that we've got to Park Tudor um, to other teachers, regardless of geography, regardless of zip code, resources um, around the world. So uh, the great news, the really exciting news is, you know, we've been thinking about, you know, how do we leverage technology in this space? So we, um, we're in, uh, in January of this year, we're launching NeuroTeach Global, which uh, through cell phones and micro learning experiences, the in-person content, the published content of, of the CTTL will be delivered. Not only that, 
it w- it leads to um, it will be the first um, um, all virtual uh, mind brain education science certification um, opportunity uh, developed by pre collegiate school for pre collegiate teachers. So we're excited about that. It sounds like a shameless marketing plug, <laughs> but uh, you know, really, we won't be satisfied. We love that Park Tutor is on this journey and. Awesome. Good. Kudos to you guys. I keep it up. Uh, and I hope your exemplars are models for the Midwest. Um, you know, and, there, and there's other schools in the Midwest are there who I hope you partner with. But we know that, you know, what about the schools that are under resourced, right? Don't have access to professional development like Park Tutor does. Um, you know, we want to help close the gap for them. So NeuroTeach Global is our next frontier. Um, and really, though, from a, from a school in terms of research, um, I still I think we're going to live in these in these spaces of you know uh, I'm very intrigued by Bob Dylan's work around space. You know what's the what's the future? Not only bricks and mortar school and classroom going to look like, but what's the virtual classroom? What are the outdoor spaces um, going to look like? Um, I, I'm still interested in this concept of what do we want a graduate of all our great schools to do? Um, you know, we are, we are great schools and we often say we are college prep, college ready. Um, but I would argue, right, if, if the research is accurate, I'll end here because I think we're going to run out of time. If the research is accurate that the jobs of the future for the kids currently in school, we don't even know what they are, uh-huh. right? Um, then getting them getting them into the great colleges and what define that any way you want is very short sighted getting them into great colleges as self aware efficient confident and independent learners is actually the sweet spot we should all be striving for because these kids are going to go into a world where they're going to constantly have to relearn right and if you don't know yourself well and your current learning strengths and weaknesses, whether you're 5, 15, or 35, you're going to become a, a, a disposable in some way. Mm-hmm. So I, I think the best thing us schools can do is look at the research out there, let kids really become more self-aware and meta about themselves, um, and make sure metacognition and reflection um, is part of the educational journey as uh, they go from preschool through 12 in, in all our schools. And, and fortunately, right, you know, Park Tudor, you, you did the right thing. You read our book. Great job. I highly, highly welcome that opportunity. But know that the, but the, we are going to continually learn about the, the brain because great universities and great researchers are diving into that. And it's our obligation to find ways for our schools, our, our, our private schools and our public schools to share authority with these great researchers and, and collaborate more. And I, and I hope that's the journey Park Tudor's on. And um, certainly that's the journey we want to help perpetuate uh, for schools like yours and, and, and schools around the world. Glenn, yes. thank you so much for Great. everything that you've written and your advice to both teachers and parents has been very helpful. Yeah glad you guys are creating this resource for the for uh, students teachers and, and parents and i look forward to following it uh and the other guests you you will soon have that was glenn whitman co-author of neuroteach join us next time as we talk with brent Kenneft, our new director of curriculum and instruction about how the implications of this play out in our classrooms <laughs>